glad to see everybody today. Let's read. Now at this time we are the world is waiting in our way to the country, to a city of Judah, and the end of the house of Zacharias, and we read of Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's reading, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And God has happened to me, that the mother of my Lord for behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped of my womb for joy, and blessed is she who believed that they would be fulfilled for what they spoke to her by the Lord. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this particular day. Lord, we thank you for blessing us for another uh, celebration of the birth of Christ season. Yes. Um, Lord, we are grateful and thankful for the redemption that you have given us uh, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the abiding presence of the Spirit of God. And Lord, we thank you that you've given us a sure word of God. Lord, open up our eyes and open up our minds and open up our ears to hear the word of the Lord today. Lord, mellow the heart. That we might receive it and make it up in our minds to live according to it. Father God, we pray for certain ones who are absent from among us today. I was talking to Elder Cole and uh, Sister Ramona having some back issues. Uh, Sister Perry had some oral surgery, uh, still in recovery. And others who I know are sick and, and going through some things. And uh, we pray for them today. We lift them up today before you in prayer. Yes. Father God, we praise you and thank you for all things today. We pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <laughs> Mr. Abel, please do not be standing for a reading of scripture. The first scripture will be First Chronicles, chapter 16, verses 23 through 31. First Chronicles 16, verses 23 through 31. We read as follows. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Proclaim his tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the people. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared among all gods, for all the gods of the peoples have idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in holy array. Tremble before him all the earth. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice. 
And let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Amen. 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 That's just the reading of the word. You may be seated at this time. And we will have a congregational song. And a symbol. On page 249. Oh, come. All the same.
Father of the fatherless and a judge for the widows. He is God in his holy habitation. God makes a home for the lonely. He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. Only the rebellious dwell in his parched land. O oh God, when you went forth before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked. The heavens also brought rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself quaked at the presence of God, the God of Israel. You shed abroad a plentiful rain, O oh God. You confirmed your inheritance when it was parched. Your creatures settled in it. You provided in your goodness for the poor, O oh God. The Lord gives the command. The woman who proclaims the good tidings are a great host. Kings of armies flee, they flee. And she who remains at home will revive the poor. When you lie down among the sheepfold, you are like the wings of a dove covered with silver, and its pinions with glistening gold. Yeah. The next scripture in the New Testament is in Luke chapter 2. It says 1 through 11, but I'm going to read 1 through 14. Luke chapter 2. Verses 1 through 14. And it reads as thus. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinus was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. In order to register along with Mary, he was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, Peace among men with whom he is pleased. Amen. Amen. Lord, uh, bless you for the reading of his word. You may be seated at this time. At this time, you have a choir and forth the minister of song. All holy night. Amen.
Brother Sean, is he here?
22. And I want to begin reading at verse 18. And I'm going to read uh, through 21. And then you can read 22 back to me. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. They came to him, meaning Jesus, and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not. And Jesus said to them, While the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast, can they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, otherwise the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear results. 22, read. No one puts new wine into old wine skins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost in the skins as well. But one puts new wine into fresh wine skins. And God's people say amen. 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 Once again, we are studying, preaching, and teaching through the book of Mark. We are studying in order to get a better understanding messianic or the earthly or redemptive ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we learn through the illumination of the Spirit, we want to apply what we learn first to our thinking and then to our living. In other words, we want to understand Mark and then strive to live it out in the most practical ways possible. Once again, we also study Mark in order to get a better understanding of all of the synoptic gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Once again, I say this because even though Matthew and Luke have information that is not in one another, both Matthew and Luke all contain all of Mark. And so really Mark is inside of Matthew and Luke. So if you learn Mark, you automatically learn a great deal of both Matthew and Luke. We are looking at this inductively. In other words, um, we are coming to our conclusions and our principles and our themes and our principles as we come upon them verse by verse. The author of the book of Mark is the ministry associate of both Peter and Paul, the man known in the scriptures as John Mark. The first historian of the church, Eusebius, informs us that Mark wrote this gospel based on the testimony of Peter, while both of them were in the city of Rome. In other words, as Peter spoke out of his memory, John wrote down Peter's memory, and then he arranged what Peter wrote in this gospel that we call Mark. It is also believed that what we read in Mark is really the oral teachings or the traditions taught by the apostles as they gave them to the first century church over and over. Remember, a very few could read and write at this particular point in time, so the way they learned was to hear something over and over and over. And so these historical stories, they would be taught over and over in order that every Christian could learn the essentials or the basics concerning the earthly ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it sort of underscores the importance for us Studying the book of Mark. It is something every believer needs to know. We need to have at least a minimal understanding of the one who has saved us from our sins. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so now we want to move on. We are in Mark 2, 18 to 22. And once again, 18 to 22 agrees as I'm just read 18 to 20 to get us started. And it says, John's disciples, and that is John the Baptist, John's disciples and the Pharisees, they were fasting. And they came and said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, 
For your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, while the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast, can they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. Believe it or not, this is a separate episode from verses 15 through 17, where Jesus had been criticized by the scribes and Pharisees for eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners. As a matter of fact, it is quite possible that some period of time had elapsed since the action described in verses 15 through 17 taking place. And I mention this because when we study Mark, we need to remember that Mark basically gives us snap snapshots of many episodes that took place in the life of Jesus trying to have your earthly ministry. He's not trying to give us an orderly, chronological sequence of these events. And so he has all of these episodes or events that took place in Christ's life, and he chooses the ones the Spirit so led him to choose, and he places these in small snapshots of events in the life of the Lord. And so this is another one of those events, and it's really separate from what we studied in verses 15 to 17. And so in these verses, the disciples of John the Baptist and also some disciples of the Pharisees, they approach the Lord concerning the subject of fasting. As a matter of fact, the text says they were in the midst of fasting as they approached the Lord. Now, you have to understand at this particular time when, especially the Pharisees, when they fasted, they had to let everybody know they were on a fast. I mean, they'd anoint themselves with so much oil and be running all over, running down their beard. They'd put on the long, sad, dreary face. And so uh, they made sure everyone knew that they were being holy and that they were on a holy fast. <laughs> and so while they're in the midst of this fast, trying to look holy, they approach the Lord and question him. And their question was, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast for your disciples do not. And so the implication in their question was Jesus was wrong in not commanding the disciples to fast, as did both the disciples of John the Baptist and the Pharisees. <coughs> now, for whatever reason, both of these groups believe Jesus should have been following their traditions concerning fasting. And they were probably fasting on certain days, certain holy days. Uh, no doubt they had certain uh, fasting garments. and Because once again, they, everybody had to know, I'm on a fast. And so, for whatever reason, they believe Jesus should have been kept keeping their tradition of fasting. Now, here we are 2,000 years later and see the same thing today amongst the people of God. And that is this. If we tend to assess the spirituality of another group according to our traditions mm -hmm. and practices. Mm -hmm. And the implication most often is this. You know, you may be saved, but you, you're not quite right. If you want to be where we are in the spirit, well. you'll do it the way we do it over here. And so they are questioning Jesus, why don't you keep our traditions? Why don't your disciples keep our traditions of fasting? Now, first, let's deal with the subject of fasting. Uh, fasting is the act of abstaining from food, abstaining from certain foods and certain drinks for religious or spiritual reasons. Fasting is mentioned in the scriptures many times. Fasting is mentioned 19 in 19 of the 39 Old Testament books and in 6 of the 27 
New Testament books. Probably the most famous fast in the Old Testament is in the book of Jonah where the people of Nineveh fasted after hearing the preaching of Jonah. Jonah preached in 40 days Jonah would be destroyed by God. And as a result of this, the king called a nationwide fast and Nineveh, uh, they repented of their sin and they fasted while they uh, sat in sackcloth and ashes and as a result, God spared the city from his judgment, uh, even though about a hundred years later, they went back into the same thing, and they were harshly judged by God. Probably the most famous fast in the New Testament is the 40-day fast of Jesus recorded in Matthew chapter 4, Mark chapter 1, and Luke chapter 4, after which the Lord was tempted by Satan three times to turn stones into bread, jump off the pinnacle of the temple and float or levitate to the ground, and also bow down and worship the devil. And so there are famous fasts in the word of God. Now, what you need to understand is this. Fasting was never commanded by God in either Old or New Testament scriptures. Fasting was never a command by God in either Old or New Testament scriptures. Although some believe fasting may have been commanded by God for the Jews on the Day of Atonement according to Leviticus 16, 29-30 and Leviticus 23, 27-31. And there's one word in that text. It's translated the word humble in the New American Standard Bible. It's the word afflict in the King James Bible. And it reads like this, this shall be a permanent statue for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall humble your souls not to do any work, whether the native or the alien who sojourns among you. Many Hebrew scholars believe the, the Hebrew word for humble, it also implies fasting. But the problem is, that is not the normal Hebrew word used when it speaks of fasting. In Leviticus, the word is anah, and normally when the Hebrews talked of fasting, they used the, uh, the Hebrew word tasom. And so in light of that, we are uncertain whether Leviticus 16, 29 through 31 and the other Levitical passage commands fasting on the Day of Atonement. But if it does, that is the only place in the Bible where God commanded a specific fast for a specific day in a specific occasion. In the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ made it clear that fasting, it was a matter of individual or personal choice. You see this in Matthew 6, 16, where Jesus said this. He said, whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. For they neglect their appearance so that they would be noticed by men when you are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward. Notice Jesus gave no command to fast, but he did say this, whenever you do fast. Meaning fasting was an individual choice, an individual concern. In the text before this morning, the disciples of John the Baptist and some of the disciples of the Pharisees, they were not referring to the one possible fast day on the Day of Atonement. They're not talking about that, even if that was a command. They were not talking about that fast, if that was a command. We're not sure, but that's not what they were talking about. What they were talking about is, why are you not following our traditions of fasting on certain days and fasting certain ways. What I want to say about this is the following. Even though the scriptures clearly address the subject of fasting, not being a command of God, and yet these Pharisees imposing this tradition upon people, even though, well, you may not know it, you should know it, and you know it now. 2,000 years later, some who are genuine believers, such as the disciples of John the Baptist, 
and some were hypocrites like the disciples of the Pharisees, they are still trying to impose upon the people of God things not commanded in the scriptures, but things which are a matter of personal choice based on circumstances in life. Jesus, why don't you command your disciples to fast like we do? Problem B, that be not a commandment of God. So they are trying to force their tradition upon Jesus and his disciples as if it were a command of God, but it was not. And still today, people want to enforce and demand people keep things that it is their tradition, but it is not a command of God in precept, principle, or anything else. Now, this is a serious spiritual problem. And it cannot lead to anything spiritually good, even though the motive may be sincere. And I say this is a serious spiritual problem because of what is recorded in this text. Well, we have two groups of sinful men questioning the Son of God, questioning the Son of Man, questioning the Messiah of Israel, questioning the Savior of the Gentiles, questioning the one who is truly God and truly sinless man as to why he is not doing something they think he should be doing. And the implication was this, that, you know, Jesus, you may be falling short because you're not fasting like we're fasting. The implication was there may be something wrong with you because you're not fasting as we fast. Questioning the Son of God. Questioning God. With the implication that there is something wrong with him for not following your tradition is a serious spiritual problem. I want to be clear. There's nothing wrong with asking God questions. Either because you don't understand or you need clarity on something. But it really does border on blasphemy to ask God questions with the subtle underlying implication that there is something wrong that God is not doing it our way. Amen. It's a spiritual problem that borders on blasphemy when you question God with the implication that you know, he's not following your traditions or he is not doing what you think needs to be done according to your beliefs, your traditions, and your particular philosophy of life. They are questioning the one who is sinless, the Son of God, as to why he's not doing it their way and what they're doing is not even a command of God. Amen. <clears throat> when people impose their traditions upon others, as commands of God that are equivalent to the real commands of God. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not murder. You shall have no other gods before me. When people start enforcing their traditions upon others as if they are equal to the genuine or real commands of God, what you are doing is if you are subtly questioning whether the authority of God through the scriptures is adequate or enough. When you start asking people, why don't you guys do it like the way we do it over here? And you have no scripture basis for it. What you're saying is, really, the scriptures just might not be enough. Therefore, you need to do it our way. And what you're doing is you're implying that the word of God is not sufficient for all things. In the Christian life. Am I making sense yeah. today? <laughs> when you start demanding others practice your unscriptural traditions as if they are the commands of God, you are basically saying God's word is not quite enough for one must obey you or our traditions, even though they're not in the scriptures, if you want to be full of the spirit as we are over here. Well, 
You know, when you start saying God's word is not enough and God says it is, that's a serious spiritual problem. Amen. When you start saying, well, you really need to do it our way, even though it's not in the scriptures, you're really saying, well, what the scripture says is not quite enough. And so when you start saying the word of God is really not enough and God says it is, I think you have a serious spiritual issue. Because God does say his word is adequate. Yeah. Yeah. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture is inspired by God. The Greek word there, Theonustos, all scripture has been breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now, if the man of God is adequate for every good work through the scriptures, that seems to say the authority of God through the scriptures is sufficient. It is enough for all things in the life of the believer and for all things in the life of the church. But if you say, that's all right, but this is the way we do it over here. And if you really want to be right, you do it the way we do it. What you are saying in the scripture is not enough. Or they are saying it is probably, and they're saying it's probably, they don't even know what they're saying, that the scriptures are only sufficient when you add what we do to it. Somebody say amen. amen. Nothing spiritually good can occur when you impose, when you or I impose our traditions upon others as if they are the commands of God. The spiritual disease that you bring about when you impose upon others things that are not in the word of God is you make the word of God of no effect. You make the word of God meaningless. This is what Jesus taught us in Mark 7, 9 through 13. He, Jesus, was also saying to them, the Pharisees, you are experts in setting aside the command of God in order to keep your tradition." You jump down to verse 13, and then the Lord says this, Thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, when you have handed down, and you do many things such as that we begin to impose the way we do it on other folks, and it's not in the word of God, you are nullifying the effects of the word of God. You are invalidating the word of God. You are saying the scripture God gave us is really not enough. And it boggles the mind how people do this all the time, and yet at the same time they think they are full of the spirit. Amen. Shouting. Falling out. Turning up their nose at others. And it's over something that, that is making the word of God of no effect. Now, when the scriptures have no effect in your life, I think you have a problem. Amen? <laughs> this text gives us the ultimate example of the spiritual rock of imposing traditions upon men. For in this text, sinful humans are questioning the Messiah of Israel, the Son of God, the Son of Man, as to why he is not following their traditions of fasting, even though it's really not even in the Scriptures. If you're like us, we grew up with all this stuff. They had a long list of stuff. Where do I begin? With the women, you can't wear pants, even though it's 85 degrees below zero. <laughs> Couldn't wear makeup, then you're Jezebel. Can't wear anything red, so somebody else is in here red. <laughs> <laughs> Now, how they came up with red, I do not know. 
Can't do this. You can't do that. You know, we weren't allowed to play baseball on Sunday, but they would watch, but they, we couldn't play baseball, baseball on Sunday, but you could watch it on TV. Y'all don't remember all this stuff? You, 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 you can't go fishing at the church on Sunday, but you can sit down and eat yourself into a coma at the church on Sunday. Now, fishing on Sunday, if you didn't already did your part with God, really, Bible don't say nothing about that. If you're not convicted by it, you can do it. If you're convicted, stay at home. But the Bible got, we talked about it in Sunday school this morning, the Bible got a lot to say about that gluttony. You didn't have a time on Sunday that shouted and we had a time. And sit down there and, and what did they call it in Sunday school morning? What, what, what graceless gluttony. Eat yourself almost until you're miserable. Ain't nothing. can't do this. You can't do that. Got to wear a tie on Sunday. Can't do this. You ain't preaching in a robe. You ain't got no power that you get on the holy robe. <laughs> what you are subtly saying is, look God, you didn't give us quite enough. And so we're going we gonna to shore up what you left undone. Wow. It, 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 it really borders towards blasphemy telling God that whatever he has done is not enough. Teach us. Amen. Teach us. Bottom line pastor. is this imposing traditions of the commands of God. It is never good. Even though if you personally choose to do it, there may be some positive spiritual benefits. There are positive spiritual benefits fasting. But when you impose your fasting upon others, you are now invalidating the word of God. Because God never commanded anybody to fast, even though we have many examples in the Bible of people fasting for certain reasons and on certain occasions. The Lord responds to this by keeping our traditions. Why are you disciples? Why are you commanding them to fast? We all doing it. And the Lord responds like this. He says, while the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast, can they? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no, they can't. So long as they have the bridegroom with them, the Lord says they cannot fast. What does all of this mean? Well, fasting was a symbol that one was in mourning. I probably need to do some teaching on fasting. Amen. Yes. We fast when we want some stuff from God. Right? Yes. All right. I want, I want, I want. You should have came to Sunday school this morning. It's not even a necessity of life. Amen. You want to fast. But normally in the Bible, fasting was a symbol that you were in mourning. Mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, was a result of a lack of something necessary in one's life or they mourned because they had suffered the loss. For example, when the people of Nineveh fasted after the preaching of Jonah, they lacked the forgiveness of God. Therefore, they fasted and went in mourning before God, and God met this need. God granted them forgiveness, and God withdrew his hand of judgment. Fasting was a symbol of mourning. I'm sad. I mean, grief. Lord, help me. In contrast, a Jewish wedding was supposed to be a joyous, celebratorious occasion. This is the illustration Jesus was using when he spoke of the bridegroom and his attendants. The Jewish wedding period lasted a week. During this period, those who attended to the bridegroom's needs in preparation for the wedding would never fast and bring about an atmosphere of gloom and doom and sadness because the occasion was supposed to be a joyous occasion. Are you with me today? Right. So the Lord is saying, you know, 
when, when the attendants are attending to the bridegroom, they can't fast, can they? He says, no, they can't. Why? Because this is a joyous occasion. Amen. So you can't come in here with a sour face, mourning, and sackcloth and ashes. So that's what he's saying. Just imagine on somebody's wedding day. And the best men and the groomsmen show up for the wedding in sackcloth and ashes. Singing, swing low, sweet chariot, coming to carry me home. Oh, swing low. Or they sing this depressive classic. I went to the house where I used to live. Grass had grown up and covered the door. And someone across the street asked me, oh, whom do you see? But no one lives there anymore. <laughs> and I went to the church where I used to go. The preacher was still there. He met me at the door. He said, I know who you are and I know who you're looking for. Oh, but they don't come here anymore. And he told me that somewhere around the throne. <laughs> now, you know, you're going into depression after you hear that. <laughs> here you are at a wedding feast. You had a wedding feast singing this. Bringing doom and gloom on the whole. You, you, you don't know that song unless you've been chucked, amen. <laughs> I don't know what I was talking about with Del Cole, right amen. He started singing, amen. It's one of the Christian depressive classics, amen. It'll really bring you down. You want to get depressed? Get the lyrics of that song and sing it a couple times, amen. This is what it would be like at a Jewish wedding if the attendants of the bridegroom started fasting. You'd be bringing gloom and doom over the whole ceremony. Jesus was symbolic of the bridegroom. And his disciples were symbolic as being his attendants. Since Jesus was symbolic as the bridegroom and the disciples, the attendants at a wedding feast, there could be no period of mourning for the disciples or a period of need for the disciples because Jesus was with them. If you're in the immediate presence of Jesus, what you got to be sad about? Amen. Amen. If he came up in here today, I hope you would start singing that. I went to the house deal. Amen. When you're in the immediate presence of God, there's no need to go into mourning. And that's what he's trying to tell them. They don't need to fast as long as I am with them. Amen. Because I am meeting their every need. I am their sufficiency. Whatever they need, I shall supply. There's no need for them to fast and mourn. I'm in the midst because of who I am. I am the son of the true and the living God. No need to fast while I'm here. Amen. Well, you're in the presence of the one who said in the beginning, let there be light and light be. Amen. You're in the presence of the one uh, by whom and through whom God made all things. Uh, you're with the one who in the beginning was with God and, 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 and was God. You're in the presence of the one who said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You don't need to fast and go in the morning when I am in your presence. That's what he's trying to relate to them. However, he said, there'll come a day where I can be taken away from you. Then you can fast. This would eventually come about 40 days after Jesus was crucified, buried, and raised from the dead on the third day. 
in the assembly back from whence he came to the right hand of the Father. He says, after this, then you can pass. What is the application of this truth? The application is this. When Jesus is in the midst, there is no lack of anything. Because of this, there's no time for mourning and fasting. I hope you know when you get to heaven, you ain't going to be mourning. Right? You're right in the presence of God. You're not going to be singing swing low. No, no, the trouble I've seen. In view of this, 
You cannot attach Jesus, attach Jesus to some old stuff. You cannot attach Jesus, the unshrunk, the new cloth, to some old church stuff. If you try to attach Jesus to some old stuff, you're going to create a greater mess than existed before. Amen. Are you with me today? Amen. Therefore, was, it was foolish to say, your, your, your fellows got to fast. They have been fasting for centuries. I think way back Moses fasted. They have been fasting for thousands of years. Now here Jesus is, and you're going to try to sew him on to some old stuff and make it better. Let's think deeply about this. Jesus is the eternal, unshrunk new piece of cloth. Why do I say this? I say this because Jesus is infinitely perfect, but he is truly God and truly sinless man. He is the promised Messiah of the scriptures. He is the Son of God and the Son of Man. He is the unique, one-of-a-kind Son of God, for even though he is truly human, to him, to see him is to see God. Amen. He was and is a sinless man who could do everything God the Father could do. He was truly a sinless man, but he was also truly God, and therefore he could truly admonish people to trust and believe in him just as they trusted and believed in God. He was truly human, and for this reason he died on a Roman cross, but because he was really the anointed Messiah of God, death could not hold his body down. On the third day, he was raised body from the dead. He was and is a man who was equal to God in all things. He is a man who nevertheless controls all authority and all power in the heavens and the earth. In view of the fact that's who he is, you cannot attach him to some old stuff and make it better. Amen. Amen. This old stuff is anything associated with man and his sinful works of the flesh in which there is no good thing by which man is trying to please God. All the so-called holy sanctified works produced by sinful humans, that is, you and I, they are an old piece of cloth. You therefore cannot attach Jesus to any of this mess and make things better. You cannot make the results of Jesus' redemptive work on the cross better by attaching that to this old stuff we got going on. Can't do this. Can't do that. Can't go here. Can't go there. Can't put this on your fingernails. Can't wear this. sanctify that mess? Yeah. You can't put Jesus onto that kind of stuff. Teach us. See, when you do this, you create a big mess. Because by trying to attach you to all this stuff we've got going on, you know what, you know what result, you know what you get? You get spiritual confusion. Bad doctrine false doctrine and spiritual insanity in the church. Right. Folks trying to really please God by attaching him to your shouting and your dancing. And I hope you know you, you can never shout and dance enough to please God. <laughs> God was and is infinitely pleased with what his son did on the cross 
of Calvary. Amen. If you are in him and he is in you through faith, then God is well pleased. You don't have to try to attach that to anything and be more right or be more holy in the presence of God. Amen. Amen. Let me move on and wrap this up. Right. Then the Lord says in verse 22, no one puts new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and the skins as well. But one puts new wine into fresh wine skins. During the New Testament period of time, wine was a it was a food staple. Everyone drank wine out of necessity every day. And here we go again. Tradition. Do you know there are people their tradition can't, will not permit them to deal with this text correctly? Mm -hmm. Come on, teach. Teach. Right. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. Come on, talk about it. Talk about it. Boy, I come from, you know, wine was a part of sin. <laughs> Y'all ain't saying amen. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> tell it. Tell it. Where I come from, you know. <laughs> Same thing I'm talking about. Your tradition invalidates the word of God. Because you believe God's going to send you to hell if you have a little bit of wine, as the Bible says, for your belly's sake and your often infirmities. But you believe if you do that, God will smite you down. Now, why it walk? Now, because you believe that, you can't even deal with what Jesus is saying. In this text, he's talking about wine. Yeah. No, Pastor, he's talking about grape juice. No, he's talking about some wine. Yeah. They didn't have grape juice back then. <laughs> they didn't have no refrigerator with no welches. They didn't. They Jeez. couldn't buy fresh grape and keep it fresh. And they had no refrigerator. Amen. So how did they, how did they, how did they make? They, they turned it into wine so they could have it all year. Let me move on to that. Come on. See, what I'm saying today with many folks is blasphemy. That's, that's some more to that trying to put the new patch yeah. on some old stuff. Mm -hmm. Everybody drank wine. Out of necessity every day. It's extremely difficult for us to understand <clears throat> your drinking water being so impure that in order for it to be safe, they had to mix it with wine and the alcohol in the wine would kill the various harmful bacteria in the wine. This wine was often stored in wineskins that were made out of goat hide. New wineskins were soft and pliable and flexible. They would therefore stretch when new wine that was not fully fermented, fermented was put in them. You see, as wine ferments, it expands. Or the gas it produces as it ferments it expands inside the wineskin. New, soft, flexible wineskins would expand as the gas expanded inside the wineskin during the wine fermentation process. In contrast, old wineskins that had already been stretched were now brittle and they were no longer flexible. If you put new wine in these old wineskins, when the gas began to expand, it would burst the wineskins wide open and you would lose both the wine and now the wine skin was no good. <laughs> New wine in this text is symbolic of the person and work of Jesus. You cannot put the new wine of Jesus into some old wine skins. For one reason, he's too immense for that. Amen. When we talk about the immensity of God, what we mean is no space can contain it. Amen. You can't bottle Jesus up. Amen. You can't, he, you can't put him into your old, beat up, brittle, raggedy, wine skin. It won't hold. Old wine skins are anything of human works, human efforts, whatever else is of human hands. 
I don't believe most Christians really grasp who Jesus is, because if you did, you would not suggest anything is needed in addition to him. Yeah. Yeah. So this lets me know we really haven't been taught exactly who Jesus is. Listen, he is one with God. God is immense. No space can contain him. The heaven itself can't, the Bible says, the heaven itself cannot contain God. He's too much. His presence is in all places. They, they, his presence transcends time and space. When there was no time, God was there. God made time. God made space. But before there was space, God was still there. God is immense. Jesus is immense. He is one with the Father in all things. To see him is to see God. To hear him is to hear God. You can't contain him. You can't put him in an old wine can. It'll burst his wide open. And what you get is a mess. Jesus is in the midst. Nothing can be added to him to complete or make anything better, but he is the new wine. Amen. And you can't put him in the old wineskins of worthless human religion and traditions. But when you do this, you get a busted flush. You get worthless. You get that which will never, God will never accept because he is holy. And anything else of human hands is exceedingly sinful. When the disciples got into the boat, remember Jesus said, let us go to the other side. Mm -hmm. It had been silly for them to say, you know what, we better take some life jackets. Because <laughs> <laughs> the boat might start to sink, and we're we going to need to help Jesus save us. <laughs> now the Lord had already told you. He had already told you, let us go to the other side. Which, which means we, we're going. We're going to make Amen. it. Amen. That's sure. I think you need some flotation devices. <laughs> if this wind crank up, we're going to have to help Jesus save us. As long as Jesus was in the boat, folks, it couldn't sink. And life jackets were unnecessary. What's the proof? They awoke him out of a deep sleep. It was, all, it was almost like, when you read it in the Greek, Greek text, it was almost like he was annoyed. Because he had taught all day, he was sleepy, and they woke me in the <laughs> Y'all waking me up for this? Remember, where's your faith? Peace. Be still. In the Greek, shut up, man. The sea became perfectly calm, and they asked themselves, what kind of man is this that even the wind and the waves are in? You can't add anything to that and make it better. Why? He is new. need to understand you are complete in Jesus. Amen. He is sufficient in all things. He is new wine. Everything else is an old wine skin. You're going to burst it open and get a big mess. And that's what we had that day in the church, a big mess, because we're trying to attach all this stuff to Jesus in order for people to be saved, in order for people to be right with God. And the result is, is you get a mess. Amen. The Bible says you are complete in Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of God in bodily form. You lack nothing in Jesus. Amen. Amen. When you have new wine, you don't need no old nasty wine. Amen. Amen. He is the new wine, the fresh wine. Nothing else can contain him. The Bible says we are, we sit with Christ in heavenly places. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love for us. Even when we were dead in our transgressions made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. Because we are now forever in the presence of Christ or he is forever in our midst according to this text. Nothing needs to be added to Jesus to improve anything in the believer's relationship with God. Amen. Amen. You sit with him right now in heavenly places. Where is he sitting? He is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Now tell me what you can do to improve that position you have right beside God because you are in Christ. What can you do to make that better? Absolutely nothing. 
living a righteous life, praying, studying scripture, exercising our spiritual gifts, fellowshipping with other believers in corporate worship. We do this because we have been seated with him already, not to be seated with him. Are you with me today? Yeah. Yeah. Why is that true? Because I'll tell you why it's true. Because you cannot put new wine in old wineskins. You cannot, you cannot add Jesus' personal work to us. But when you do, you'll create a spiritual disaster, the bursting of spiritual wineskins. And that's the problem in the church today. We don't understand grace. We don't understand we are complete in Jesus. We don't understand if you're in Christ, God is saying you're all right with me. We don't understand that he forever makes intercession for us. Therefore, it's going to be all right. Amen. Amen. You may struggle. You may stumble and fall down. But listen, as he told Peter, I prayed for you. Amen. He, he forever intercedes between us and the Father. And if you know him, you will see his face in peace someday. Amen. 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 Bottom line is that Jesus is new one. You and I and everything else attached us to some old wax. <laughs> you need to be made a new wine scan by God. So the new wine of Jesus can be in you forever. Does that make sense? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm done. Then, Lord, just help us to understand a simple truth. If you are in Jesus, you are complete. You don't need anything else, anybody else, any other thing. You are complete in him. Hope help us to remember we try to add him to other things. It's like trying to sew a new piece of cloth on an old garment and get a bigger tear. Help us to understand. We try to do that. It's like putting new wine in the old wine skins and bursting and making a mess. And there's total loss. Lord, help us to be content and assured in Him, our Savior, washed in His blood, covered by His cross. Saved by his grace, Amen. saved by his mercy, yes. sustained by the word of his power. Yes. Father God, help us in all of these things. Is there one today you do not know Jesus Christ? For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of itself. It is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. If there's a soul today. And the Spirit of God is nudging you and dealing with you. And you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Messiah and Savior by embracing the gospel. If there is one to offer work with here to minister to you, if there is a soul today, would you raise your hand? <coughs> Father God, I praise you and thank you. Lord, give that soul that does not know you one more chance to be saved. Lord, I just pray for the many needs that exist today. They are so great. But Lord, we know that you are able and that you can do all things. 
Father God, I praise you and thank you for every opportunity to preach. I know that it is a privilege and not a right. Lord, keep our minds stayed on you, saturated in your word. Lord, help us to develop a biblical worldview in order that everything that we look at is clouded by what we know in the word of God. Father God, I pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Let all God's people say amen. Amen. amen.
short, bro. <laughs> Luke 2.14, and let's all read it together. Glory. 